You may have seen this before. A child or adolescent has difficulty following multi-step directions, misunderstands information, has trouble understanding in noisy environments, mishears words. It could be an attention issue, a language problem, or it could be an auditory processing disorder. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. B. Braun. She is a clinical audiologist with 23 years of experience completing central auditory processing evaluations. She is an expert in this area and specializes in testing children as young as five and those diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, traumatic brain injury, and those identified as twice exceptional. Dr. Braun is going to tell us about what an auditory processing disorder is, and she will discuss activities designed to retrain the brain, strengthen existing auditory pathways, establish neural connections, and improve auditory processing skills for both children and adults. There is great information packed into this episode. I can't wait for you to listen in. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Dr. Braun, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. It's, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast for a while, and I'm glad that we were finally able to make it work. And we've been eager to talk about auditory processing on this podcast. And when I thought about who can I have on this podcast to talk about this subject, of course, you were the one. You were mm-hmm. my go-to person when I suspect any child has some auditory processing issues. And we've had the experience of working with kids in the past Um, that we've both evaluated for different things. And it's just been such a great experience. And the parents have just loved having that input from you about the auditory processing piece that, you know, we don't address as neuropsychologists when we do evaluation. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Glad to chat. (laughs) So I want to jump right in because, you know, auditory processing, you have this great quote on your on your website, auditory processing is what the brain does with what it hears. Can you explain to parents about that? Because so many parents, when I talk about, you know, referring them for auditory processing, they'll say, oh, my, I already had his hearing checked and he's fine. (laughs) So can you talk a little bit about what you mean by auditory processing? Sure. And that great quote is from the great Dr. Jack Katz. It's not my quote because he's kind (laughs) of the godfather of auditory processing and still practicing. I think he's 92. Oh my. I know. He's amazing. He's amazing. Um, So yeah. So auditory processing really is what happens when the sound leaves the ears and traverses up the auditory pathways to finally get processed as language. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that everybody thinks it's a thing. Auditory processing is a problem, but it's actually uh, really the umbrella. And under the umbrella are several subtypes. So really to get a really good auditory processing evaluation, that looks at what happens when the sound leaves the ears and then goes from the right ear to the left side of the brain, the left ear to the right side of the brain, and then back across. So that battery of tests really looks at that entire pathway because under that umbrella of auditory processing, you might have one subtype, there could be two subtypes, and it really impacts how the child learns and also the most important part, which is the remediation, because there's a lot that we can do to strengthen those pathways, but we have to know where the problem is before we can, you know, give the right remediation tools. Absolutely. And that's, and that's an important point when we think about parents who are observing their child or even educators who are observing difficulties with a child in the classroom. Um, and they're not knowing what they're seeing and what is the, the underlying issue. So what are some signs that children, adolescents may have problems with auditory processing? What are some common things that parents come to you with? Yeah. So I think probably. The biggest complaint is difficulty following multi-step directions. I think that's probably a pretty 
standard one across the board. Um, and that typically means, you know, if you're giving two or three step directions, the kiddo just isn't able to follow along. And I, I say kiddo, but really that I see a lot of adults for the same issues. So uh, difficulty with following multi-step directions, difficulty understanding in the presence of background noise, um, difficulty retelling information. So I know that sometimes can be um perceived as a speech and language problem, but in reality, there's an auditory component to it. Um, difficulty with academics, and that can be reading fluency, that can be reading comprehension, uh, can be writing. And once again, I get that, well, that's not an auditory problem, but it actually is. And so it can really impact the academics as well. So sometimes like if I get referrals from a neuropsychologist, we're looking at difficulties maybe with working memory, listening comprehension, and that can also translate into the reading comprehension problem. Um, and then just, you know, I get a lot of referrals because the teacher will say to the parent, you know, is his hearing okay? Because he's having difficulty in the class. Um, the other issue sometimes is it can look like it's an attention problem because they're not able to focus. They're not able to keep track with what's going on. But when in reality, what's happened is they're not able to process the information and they've just sort of checked out because they're not able to do what everybody else is doing. So it really kind of runs the gamut. It can be quite, um, quite variable. The other one piece that I think that is important to note is that some kids with a particular subtype will have difficulty with picking up like on tone of voice or what the, we call the prosody of speech. So, so these may be kids who are not interested at all in nursery rhymes when they were little, um, or they just have difficult time putting lyrics to songs. Um, and that can also impact how they perceive speech. And, you know, and that's so interesting because many of the things that you've described and you alluded to this, you know, look like other disorders. It looks like a receptive language issue. It looks like a reading phonological processing issue related to reading. It looks like ADHD. And I'm finding, because I know when I'm doing an assessment and I, and I know that there's ADHD or even a dyslexia, but there's something else, which is why I send them to you. There's another piece that's missing. How do you distinguish if you are the first point of contact what is ADHD and what is auditory processing? Because it seems like there's a lot of overlap or, or, or comorbidity, that they're both there in the, in the same child. For sure. And if you look at the research, there's like a 30 to 40% of kids who have auditory processing or central auditory processing, it's the same exact thing, um, have ADHD comorbidity. So we've got both issues going on. Um, so in my testing, you know, I can have an individual who's you know, bouncing up and down and is all over the place or is clearly inattentive. But what I'm looking for in my testing is a pattern of results. So as an example, when I did give tests, it's called dichotic listening, where they hear different information in both ears at the same time, very powerful auditory processing testing. Usually, not always, but usually the left pathway is weaker for a child who has an auditory processing disorder. So in those tests, if I'm seeing that there's a left ear problem on all of those dichotic tests, we have a clear auditory processing disorder. If things are all over the place, you know, if we've got a right ear and a left ear and, and missing things, then we might, then I might step back and go, mm, this may be more ADHD and maybe we need to look at getting that under control first. And then if that's not an issue, then you come back. But if I have a a really clear pattern of findings, even if they're really, fun you know, having functional attentional problems, and even in my booth, it's still an auditory processing disorder because the, it's almost like puzzle pieces. Those puzzle pieces just fit perfectly together. Right. And that I think that's a really good explanation, particularly for parents who might be trying to figure out, is this ADHD? Is this auditory processing? Because they're hearing the different terms. And sometimes it can be confusing as to what it might be. And we know that they have different treatment plans, depending on what it is. 100%. And you mentioned a central auditory processing disorder. So we've been talking about auditory processing, kind of what the brain does with what it hears. But when does do those difficulties cross cross the threshold and become an auditory processing disorder or a central auditory processing disorder? What exactly is that? So this, it's actually central auditory processing and auditory processing are the same thing. It's just a bit of a, a conflict between the professionals and my my. <laughs> my okay. arena where some audiologists really feel like it's it's can only be a central issue and so and it is it's really after it leaves the ears right uh, it's just a technical 
issue that we have. So central auditory processing, auditory processing are exactly the same thing. I think the big misnomer that can happen, I just was I got it off an IEP this morning where this happened, where some of the tests that, let's say, a psychologist will give or a speech-language pathologist will give are, are very narrow tests of auditory processing. So if a child, as an example in this IEP, they did great on the phonological processing areas, so they said the child didn't have an auditory processing disorder. And I had to really jump in and say, well, no, that's absolutely not true. The child actually does have an auditory processing disorder, just not in that area. The phonological processing is happening in what's called the primary auditory cortex on the left side of the brain. So the left side of the brain was strong for this child. The issue was in the bridge that connects the left with the right. So I think therein lies the big issue is how do we how do we make sure that people who are, are identifying or diagnosing are really looking at all aspects of the auditory system, which is a central problem? Right. And I think that's why I defer to you <laughs> anytime there's a question about auditory processing, because as a neuropsychologist, I don't diagnose an auditory processing disorder. You know, I perform neuropsychological evaluations and I can identify neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD, a language disorder, specific learning disorder, like dyslexia. And if I find that a child is at risk for auditory processing, then I will refer them to someone like you, an audiologist, to to determine whether or not there is an actual auditory processing disorder. So what does that additional testing look like? Or what does your evaluation look like? Because sometimes, you know, kids will come to me and they may have had the evaluation done by me or another psychologist. And they're saying, well, I thought I had an evaluation. Now you're requesting additional testing. What does your testing look like for parents who might have said, I've already done a full neuropsych or a psychoed from the school? Um, how is this going to be different? Yeah, big, big difference. So, of course, I'm going to test the child's hearing for sure and check everything. You know, So that's called our peripheral hearing. So is the eardrum healthy? Is the middle ear space healthy? Do we have reflexes? And are the hearing thresholds normal? That's the standard. Um, then the testing really breaks down into all those different subtype areas. So I give that dichotic listening. So they're in a sound booth under headphones. Sometimes they use a speaker for different tests. They'll do this dichotic listening where they hear words or numbers or sentences in both ears at the same time, but they're different. So like as, as an example, one of the tests, it goes upstairs, down at the same time, and then town. So upstairs, downtown with two of the words exactly exactly at the same time. And that assesses that ability or really allows me to look at the pathways in a unique way. So I can see what happens when the information leaves the right ear, crosses over to the left side of the brain. So the left side of the brain is where we process sound and language. So it really allows me to look at, is that information leaving the right ear and crossing over there and being processed the way it's supposed to? Then the information leaves the left ear, goes over to the right side. That's where we see pictures, where we hear music. So in order to get processed as language, it actually has to go back across the bridge to get over to the language side. So it does that ping pong. So then I'm looking at that pathway. Is that pathway clear? And then based on that dichotic testing, um, then we can look at where, where if there's an issue, where is it happening? So as an example, if the issue is with the left ear, so that's not really the ear, it's the pathway, then I give tests where they hear tonal patterns, a couple of them like this, it goes, mm, mm, mm. and then they have to tell me what they hear, low, low, high, low, high, low, high, high, low. If they're able to get that information over to the right side and then back across the bridge, they're going to do fine. But if there is an issue in the, that pathway, then there's going to be a breakdown. So if the child cannot tell me what they hear, then I also have them hum those responses back for me. So if they're able to hum them beautifully, then I know the pathway going over to the right side is strong. I know the pathway on the right side is strong, but the problem is in that bridge. That's a, one of the subtypes, which is called an integration deficit. So that really just allows me to narrow it down. I also have a second test that looks at that same area, but with long and short tones for the same reason. Um, I also give tests of what's called monaural low redundancy speech perception. A lot of words that really just mean de graded speech. So can the child hear speech and noise? So I give single words and background noise. I give sentences and background noise. Can the child understand that speech that's not clear, kind of mumbly, 
or someone who speaks with an accent. Um, that looks at just low, just single words that are filtered. So they repeat the words back. I give tests of fast speech. So some kids can really struggle to under fast, understand fast speech. So sentences that are time compressed or fast. Um, and that really looks at the left side of the brain now in this auditory cortex to look at the ability to see how well are they able to understand speech if it's not clear. I give tests of timing that look at kind of the low brain stem, if you will, how well is that information able to leave both ears and then connect in the brain stem the way at the same time and then go up. So that's just a simple test where they hear little glitches and noise. And then every time they hear the glitch, they push a button. Um, and that's looking at the timing portion. And then I also give tests of sound blending. Um, and this is all auditory. So there's no visual component here. This is how well can they put the sounds together, hold the sounds, and then say a word. And that can sometimes tie into the dyslexia component because if they have a really hard time holding on to those sounds, then that tells me that the, the reading issue is not just about what they see on the page. It's also about how they put the sound with what they see on the page and how well they're able to hold, hold it on. So it's just kind of broad testing that takes typically about an hour and a half to two hours, um, but very different than what uh, they're going to get anywhere else. Absolutely. And it sounds like, you know, when you're looking at auditory processing in all those different ways, you're really going to end up with a profile of strengths and weaknesses for that child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And so when you find that there is an auditory processing disorder and you give this information to parents, the first question they're going to ask is, what can we do? Can these auditory processing skills be improved and what do you say? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so I always try and, and before I start talking to them, I always try to preface this by, listen, we can change this. And we absolutely can. And it's actually very exciting because I started this, gosh, almost 24 years ago now. Um, and did this for the school districts for a really long time. And there was no no remediation that you could really do. So it was all just accommodations, you know, maybe have like hearing assistive technology or an FM system, preferential seating, extra time for tests, kind of the basic accommodations you would expect to get in the school. But then, um, and, and there were remediation approaches, but they were all done at the university level. You know, typically you'd have to go for the summer somewhere and they would do these kind of research-based things at university level. Then these programs started to become commercially available. So there's there's a few of them out there now that allow you to do all of the training at home. Um, so these these programs really change the pathways. It's actually, I mean, it's probably the most exciting thing that I've seen in my career um, because I can see kiddos, especially when kids are young, that their little brains change so fast, you know, it's all based on neuroplasticity and how we can make changes in the brain. Uh, so that's the good news. And then um, there's also some really nice little apps too. It just depends on what that subtype is and the severity. But I've got another, I, an app that I recommend that works on those tonal patterns. And I'm, I mean, the improvements I've, be, I've seen has been remarkable. Just with that one little app, I've had parents <laughs> say that their daughter's she cannot sing. She sings all the time. And her voice, you we just cringe. Like, it's so bad. But they don't want to say anything, right? <laughs> and then after doing this tonal pattern training, I remember mom came back and said, her voice is so much better because she can now hear those tonal changes. And it's just this kind of self-regulation. And so she just had a much, much better voice or, um, you know, not being able to hear the lyrics in songs and then being able to pick up on the lyrics. Um, so, or even just more importantly, you know, everyday conversation, being able to understand what somebody's asking them, you know, being able to, to repeat and or answer a question without having to ask somebody to repeat themselves over and over again. So, so there's a ton that can be done at home. It's quite exciting. That's very exciting. And I, I feel like like this arena and this area is similar to other areas in our field where the treatment interventions catch up much later than the identification. <laughs> you know, oh, we're yes. able to identify dyslexia and ADHD and auditory processing for quite some time, but the research regarding intervention really took longer to come on board. 100%. One, and you know, the other thing that I have found, and this is, 
I wish there was more collaboration. And I think that's what's really missing is, you know, there are certain parts of the brain. We have lots of different pathways that interconnect. So the dyslexia example is, you know, that auditory cortex is very much responsible for reading. And so I feel like if the audiologists and the ed therapists and the psychologists could, I, you know, all sit down and, and really go about, okay, what does this look like if there's an auditory component versus there's no auditory component? Um, I think it would be really nice. Or even um, this bridge, this integration deficit, I'm only looking at the auditory pathways of a very large part of the brain. Um, and there are visual pathways that run through, there are motor pathways, there are sensory pathways. So it's very common when there's this integration deficit, that there are visual processing disorder, there's um, fine motor control with handwriting, sometimes there can be gross motor, oftentimes there can be hypersensitivity to sounds and touch, and all of those are the pieces that the occupational therapist is going to be involved in. So sometimes I'll get these kiddos who have all of these things, and I try and tell the parent, actually, it's just this one area of weakness in the brain. And we all have to look at it individually, unfortunately. So my therapy is going to be different than the vision therapy versus the occupational therapy. But we're strengthening this big band of fibers is what's happening. And so the collaboration piece, I think, is important. So as I've gone through my career, I now realize, wow, if if I see an integration deficit and there's reading issues, I'm going to immediately refer to the vision therapist or the developmental optometrist to do the vision assessment. Or I'm going to then start to ask, do we have problems with handwriting? Do we have problems with those kind of core balance issues, you know, do we maybe have to refer over to the occupational therapist? Um, so they're, they're all very interconnected, but we all do our individual, you know, therapies, if you will. But that's just because of the way the, the brain is designed. Um, but if we can hit all of those pieces, then we're going to really strengthen those pathways. Absolutely. And and I think about so many kiddos that, again, have these multiple issues. And, you know, when we miss one piece like auditory processing, it kind of stays unaddressed. And oftentimes they don't respond to the other interventions that are that are taking place in the same way because, you know, they, they really haven't addressed the auditory processing issue or the dyslexia, or the attention piece, which allows them to, you know, stay focused long enough to participate in the auditory processing intervention. And so I agree with you 100% that there really needs to be so much more communication between the professions in terms of the work that we do, because there's so much overlap. So very true. And it's kind of nice that, you know, I've been in LA now for a long time. Um, so kind of you make these wonderful connections with wonderful professionals. And so, you know, a lot of times, like as an example, a speech language pathologist may be working in, on articulation with a child for a long time, and there's just not that improvement going on where they would expect, like, we have been working on this sound for a year and nothing has changed. And so they'll refer to me and sure enough, they have this auditory decoding problem. So the sound that they're hearing is the sound that they're making. And so you can't correct it because they don't hear it any differently. So in order to get there, we have to strengthen those pathways so that now when they hear it, they're going to be hearing it the way that they should be hearing it. Um, or the same is true for language, you know, following directions, sequencing, pragmatic language. Um, you know, they can be working on it for a really long time, but unless we strengthen those auditory pathways, that information is just not going to get in there the way it should. Absolutely. And, you know, there, and that also speaks to the idea that there are not only different neurodevelopmental disorders and neurodevelopmental challenges, but within auditory processing, there are different types of auditory processing disorders. And, and you are well positioned to help parents and educators better understand what those different types are and how to address them. Because I imagine the, the treatment plan is going to be different depending on the type. Totally different. Totally different. Yeah. And I think I wish to, I don't know how to educate people in a, you know, in a broader way, but I think well, you're that doing is, it now. <laughs> <laughs> this is helping. Yeah, that is the big issue is because, you know, I have a ton of parents who have had an IEP through the school and they say, oh no, auditory processing is just fine. And, but maybe a private person is referring them to me and I'll say, well, could you just send me the report? Let me just take a look. And they've done one little slice of that big puzzle and they've called it normal, but the but the takeaway then, just like you said, the takeaway is everything is fine, but it's actually not. Um, so it, it's it's frustrating for parents, I think, especially because they don't they don't understand. They don't have the knowledge base. Um, 
So we just chip away, I guess. <laughs> yes. And then we have people like you here to let parents know. And I love the example you used about the speech and language therapy and the, the child not responding in the way that you would expect. And again, it's because this auditory processing piece hasn't been addressed. And I see that with kids with attention issues as well. And also kids who struggle with phonological processing. Yep, and, for sure. And thinking about kids who are going back to school, we're recording this in September, and you talked about the interventions for auditory processing disorders. Are there also things that educators, teachers can do in the classroom in terms of accommodations to further support kids? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, my reports usually have a full page <laughs> and districts are not always so happy. But um, so it dep- once again, depends on the subtype. So as an example, that kid who has an integration deficit typically has a much, much weaker left ear, left pathway. So very important for that kiddo to sit close to the teacher with the right ear to the teacher. Because if the left ear's to the teacher and there's any noise going on around them, they're going to really miss a lot of information. So we have to have the kiddo in the front with the right ear to the teacher teacher. You know, we don't want them sitting next to the pencil sharpener, which is the noisiest thing in the classroom or next to the computers or air vents. We want to keep them away from from the background noise. A kiddo who has um, this integration deficit will also really, really need to have things repeated instead of rephrased. So when we rephrase information, it's like they're getting a brand new message. And so these are the kiddos who have difficulty taking the language and creating a picture of what they hear. So an example is if I were to say, uh, oh, look at that purple butterfly with yellow spots. We process that language on the left, but then we send it over to the right side and we create a picture of that. Your butterfly looks different than my butterfly. So if that if that kiddo is in a classroom and instructions are being given and they aren't getting it, but now what we do is we rephrase. Now they're trying to create a whole new picture of what they're trying to hear. So repeating instead of rephrasing is really important for a child with an integration deficit. The other thing with a child who has an integration deficit is they're going to do much, much better if they can see things first without the auditory information because they have very strong right brain skills. So visually, they really can take information and hold on to it. They tend to be very creative. They just see things in a way that the average person cannot. So with that kid, we want to really let them see it first. So I say to teachers, let's say we're doing something on volcanoes. If we can throw that up on the smart board, the visual, and just let the whole class to take 30 seconds just to take it in visually, then to start the teaching, then to do whatever the hands-on piece is, he's going to do so much better because now he's going to have it in his brain before you start talking. But I've been in a lot of classrooms and what typically happens is it's up on the board, the teacher starts talking, some kiddos passing out papers, half the kids are already filling out the paper, and this kid has a hard time integrating all of that information. So one modality at a time. Versus, let's say, a kid who's got an auditory decoding problem, they actually need to have information rephrased because they're mishearing it. So the problem isn't being able to create that picture. For them, the problem is they're mishearing the words. And so if we rephrase it in a different way, now then maybe we're going to use a different word that they're going to get. They also need to have multiple pieces. They like the multi-modalities at the same time. So if they're hearing it and seeing it at the same time, that's actually going to help them to make the connection because their bridge is strong. The problem is getting it over to the left side of the brain. So they they typically will need multi-modality cues at the same time. So so there's lots of different pieces. And then there's your standard recommendations. Of course, we want to check for comprehension, right? We want to break things into smaller segments, breaking in parts to whole and whole to parts so that the kids get that bigger picture because that can be challenging for them as well. Um, And sometimes if the child has problems with background noise, we we might recommend um, hearing assistive technology or that FM system. My personal approach to it with an FM system is... I always like to try and strengthen those auditory pathways first because then we don't ever need that that system long term. So my goal is to do the auditory training first and then I'm going to retest after they're done with the training and see if we still need it. If they don't need it, then awesome. We've we've really worked that skill and they no longer have the same issues that they may have had before. If though, you know, you're in a class of 
36 kids and it's really noisy and the child's really struggling, then we may go ahead and say, let's do the FM system short term. Hopefully we're going to do the auditory training and then, you know, he's not going to need that long term. Um, so like in FM systems where the teacher wears a microphone and then the child wears what look like little devices, they almost, they look like hearing aids, but they're not. They're just to be able to hear the teacher's voice. So teacher's voice goes right into their ears and you bypass the noise that's in the classroom. It just makes the teacher's voice louder. The problem though is, is that when kids hit about fifth grade, they do not want to have those on their ears anymore. They, I mean, middle schoolers, that is the absolute worst thing you could do for them (laughs) and high school as well. So if we're going to do it, we're going to hopefully just do it short term and the earlier grades with the goal that we don't have to do it long term. But that's kind of a standard recommendation is is the FM system. But like I said, my goal is always to strengthen before we, we even go that route. Right. And those classroom accommodations and modifications are so important and to get them right is so important. Oh, yes. And I love that you've that you've highlighted some that are really beneficial for kids, but also emphasizing that you can't do them alone. You also emphasize the importance of a treatment plan. And this is in addition to the treatment plan for auditory processing disorders. For sure. And and the great thing is, I mean, I've had contracts with well over 80 school districts and um, lots of school districts are, are actually doing the training at school now. So just it, it depends on the schedule and some parents actually prefer to do it at home, but the school is kind of facilitating it. So um, the nice thing is we're really seeing a lot of improvement because the schools are doing the training. That's exciting. Yeah, it is Lots exciting. Lots of exciting things that you're sharing here today. <laughs> That's yeah, it's great. super exciting. It's been a long process, you know, but but I think w- once these districts have seen the improvements with the kids and they see across the board how things have gotten so much better, they're seeing the value in it. So, um, yeah, I have some districts who do it routinely now. Now, you know, you've talked about auditory processing disorders and we, and you even mentioned neuroplasticity and it's, it's a topic that I, that I emphasize when I'm talking to parents and talking about the importance of intervention because that brain can really change, particularly when kids are really young. Now with central auditory processing disorder, is this something that persists into adulthood like other neurodevelopmental disorders? Does it depend on the intervention? What do you say to parents about that? Yeah, I think it depends on a a number of things. So um, if you start really young, so I test down to five, if you start five, six, seven, the improvement is just unbelievable. It's it's phenomenal. I mean, I'm able to get those scores in the normal range and because they're still at that point where they're learning to read and they're, you know, reading to learn they're really going to be able to pick up on those pieces. And those kids may not even then have anything really reflective of an auditory processing problem as they grow because those pathways are strengthened really early. We can absolutely make pathway changes even into adulthood. So so that's the great news. Um, My goal, of course, is to always get them into the normal range. doesn't always happen, but the majority of of the time that it can. But the analogy that I give is that what what my training, or anybody's training really, is that it's almost like a freeway. So like this bridge especially. So like there's a lot of traffic on the lanes of this freeway. So the training is really designed to strengthen the neural connections on the existing lanes that are there. So we're going to clear the traffic and we're going to build new lanes on our freeway. So now our freeway is wider and it's open. But we still need to teach that child how to drive on the freeway. And that's where the interventions come in. That's where whatever the school-based interventions are, the private practice, celebrate, you know, so educational therapy, the speech language therapy, even the OT, those are then going to teach the child how to drive on that freeway. So hopefully then the as we do all of these pieces together, hopefully as a team, then we're going to see that, yes, the child can absolutely overcome the auditory processing issues. Now, does that mean that, you know, they're going to be fantastic in an environment that's so auditorily overloaded that they may, may still be struggling as an adult, possibly. So as an example, you, you know, you might have somebody who's a stockbroker, right? Crazy noise, you got to hear things and going back and forth and going back and forth. That might not be the best career for somebody who has a lot of auditory processing issues. Um, even if we get everything into the normal range, it may still be challenging for them. Um, that being said, I've had, I mean, I've seen a lot of high schoolers who really struggled and do are, they're doing so incredible incredibly well in college. Um, So even doing the training at a later age can really make a difference. And I think that is so encouraging to so many parents and, and to the students who are experiencing the struggle themselves, because I know that 
when students understand their struggles, it can be really empowering because then they really know that there's something that can be done to ameliorate the difficulty and things can change for them. So true. And I will tell you, so one of the programs that I um, recommend is like 25 minutes a day, five days a week, anywhere from three to five months. It's a big time commitment. And um, I have found through the years that teenagers don't really like it a whole lot. (laughs) I wonder why. (laughs) And there's a lot of pushback and the parent has to do it with the child. And so I always tell the parent, we need to have a buy-in from the student. The, The student needs to understand what the difficulties are, what they're doing to help themselves and to understand why they're doing it. Because... If you don't help them to understand what the issues are, then it's it's just going to be a battle across the board, and we don't we really don't need that. But I think if you help them to understand what's going on and why they're doing it, it's really remarkable the improvement that they see. Absolutely, Dr. Braun, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with our listeners. I know that there are going to be a lot of parents who suspect their child has auditory processing issues. They may want to reach out to you for more information. What is the best way for people to contact you? Oh, my website's probably the best way. Um, you can just shoot me an email through that or give me a call. Um, it's auditoryprocessingctr.com. Wonderful. And I will put all of your information in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. This was fantastic. Thank you so much, Karen. This was really, really fun. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.